Hey, you live. Hey, guys. John Fitson. I'm here. Are you? <laughs> so, anyway, um, gosh, I guess people could do comments and say if uh, they're on or will people just sign on with us. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, we can uh, I leave comments in the YouTube, I think, or... Uh, or should we just have them call us again? Uh, that certainly worked last week. I think that's, uh, yeah. that doesn't hurt. If you guys want to call me and talk to moi, we're supposed to be talking to a, a guy, Skull, and uh, we're trying to hook up with him. I'm really impressed with uh, a video that I saw with him, and hopefully we'll be able to get a hold of him. And uh, But in the meantime, if you want to call moi on my special phone, call me, 801-918-3725. And you can ask me anything, you know, anything at all. So that's that. But while you're doing it, Oh, you don't have an opener, do you? Uh, oh, never mind. Never mind. This this shows you how tough I am. Watch this. Oh, God, I hate that. Every time I do that with uh, my thumb, it just... Uh, I'm drinking a Guinness out of my big fucking Viking horn. Hey, that's cool, huh? Big fucking Viking horn. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pour it in. I'm still waiting for you, Skull. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I'm going to pour this in, and I am going to have a tasty beverage. You know, so uh, like I said, if you want to call me, 801-918-3725, and talk to moi. So, you know, so anyway, Skull. Mmm. Look, Mom. <laughs> a milk, uh, uh, what is it, a Guinness stash. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we can talk about anything. So give me a call. 801-918-3725. And, uh, you know, damn, my wife can call me. My daughter can call me. Malicious can call me. We got a new girl that can call. That's you're gonna meet. She's gonna be doing her survival stuff. Uh, her name is Malibu. So, what am I doing? Uh, These are live questions coming. Oh, okay. God, you're gonna have to read them to me. Okay. Okay. Wait a sec. Steve's gonna. All right, we've got uh, Slavko online. We got Kane thirty eight. Lorenzo Moreno. Uh, yeah, cool. Lorenzo from Texas. John cool. from New York City says, hey, looks like Three River Blades has joined us. Slavko wants a Guinness. <laughs> I'm drinking it for you, dude. <laughs> Is that taking up too much time when I'm drinking? <laughs> <laughs> we got time. Any uh, questions, guys? Or Call me, guys. I got my phone right here, and we'll put you live on air. They, we can hear you. 801-918-3725. Yeah. My wife can even call. God, wouldn't, wouldn't you guys just love to hear from my wife? Find the inner secrets of John Fitzen and all the wild women in my life and how my wife puts up with it. Uh, one of our common commenters, hi, y'all, is uh, asking if you do any throwing knives. Yeah, I do throwing knives. I did. Uh, one of the guys, he's supposed to be one of the top throwers in the nation. He held a record for throwing the most continuous knives and sticking them, and that was all sorts of knives. So I've done that. Um I went to a show in California, and uh, 
one of my real expensive $2,500 Damascus knives. This guy, he's won some record or something like that, and he was holding it, this big 11-inch blade, and all of a sudden he takes it and chucks it in this big piece of wood. God, it about died, you know, because sometimes, you know, they can go off a little bit, and oh, my God, but he stuck that damn thing. He goes, God, John, that throws really good, and I'm looking at him going, you bastard. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's a $2,500 knife. You know? oh. so, yeah, if he would have messed it up. It's just, you know, like, you know, a knife like that, shit, it's like drinking Kool-Aid out of this Viking Stein. You never want to do that, right? Never. <laughs> <laughs> he is shot just for suggesting that. So... You guys know, I don't know if you guys know, Steve's really into uh, tennis. And he approached me about making a tennis racket to where where there's a hidden knife in it to where he can just, you know, jump across the net and slash the guy's fucking throat <laughs> if they win him. <laughs> you still interested in that? What? <laughs> I'm still trying to get Skull on the line here. So I'm gonna well, I've seen him there racket. for a minute. So, I'm trying to get him here. Yeah, if you guys want, like I said, give me a call. 801-918-3725. Or, you know what, maybe I'll call Malicious, and you guys can talk to her a little bit. And uh, let me see if I can get her, because you guys are so damn quiet. God, am I the only noisy one here? Let's see if we can get her. Oh, boy. One ringy dingy. <laughs> Hello. Well, do I have malicious on the phone? Oh, hey, boss, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, we're having problems getting people on here but they can hear you and uh see me uh it just you know computer stuff you know it's the nsa you know how the nsa doesn't want me to talk to anybody you know so well that's gay <laughs> <laughs> so tell them what you've been doing love tell the guys what's been happening talk me tell them mm-hmm well, you know, been buying more knives because I have an addiction, and uh, <laughs> I've been practicing dual butterfly knifing, whatever that's called, like double hand ambidextrous, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I can actually do it. I'm getting way better at it, so I'm proud of myself. Cool. So uh, that's pretty cool. And been shooting a bunch. Thank you for everyone who watched my... Uh, my uh, shooting little movie I made. <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, so just shooting and nice stuff. That's, that's basically it. Well, aren't you going to tell people where you went? Where I went? Yeah. Oh, you mean last week? Yeah. To the most unhappy place on earth. It is the most happy place in the whole damn earth. And I like I it. I hated it. I'm oh. just kidding. I didn't, okay, I didn't hate it, but I, I would rather cut off a limb. Then, then go there again. So she yeah. went. She went to <laughs> Disneyland, you guys, and I like not Disneyland. What? John, not by choice, John. It was a family thing, and I love my family, so that's why I went. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get home and play with my knives. So he couldn't bring all my knives on the plane. The guy was like, "You can't bring all these on the plane." And I was like, "You are rude." Oh. So. Hey, do we got him? Oh, we have him. Yeah, hey, finally. Well, you, you know, guys, I'll tell you, we're gonna, I'm gonna cut you off, honey. Uh, we just got Skull on there. You gotta watch this. But she's gonna be on next week. Well, next week we're going to the Shot Show. So I'm gonna put I might post up. What's that? I might have her instead of you. Yeah, yeah. Me? No, she's going with me. Hmm. Yeah. So we'll be at a certain booth. I'll tell you guys where we're at at Shot Show, and hopefully this time I won't get kicked out. <laughs> yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. We're not getting kicked out. I'll see everyone at the shop show. I'm super excited. Okay, we'll see you, love. Bye.
Okay, I love you all. Goodbye. Okay. So, I got Skull on there with me. Yeah, hey, John. That was the typical problem with Google. Like, I've already done this multiple times via the Hangout, and every single time it's the same kind of problem. Like, where's the invite? Oh, you have to follow here and do this and do that. It's <laughs> counterintuitive. That's, ah, oh, it makes you nauseous. <laughs> well, hey, I got to tell you something, bud. I watched that thing with you about the samurai sword and the broadswords and everything. You were the man. You are the man. <laughs> Thanks, that, was, man. <laughs> that was fucking kick-ass, dude. Everything I've always taught people about samurai swords versus European swords and everything that you were coming off, I was down to going, yes. And you know how many people fight me on that shit? And I'll bet you you had a lot of people give you shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. So Let's hear some of them. <laughs> oh, well... You know, one of the main problems, one of the things that irritate me the most is when people get on there and, and talk about, you know, how slow and clumsy and this and that longsword is, and it's very obvious that they have never handled one in their entire life. They have never been exposed to any historically accurate replica of a longsword. They don't yeah. know the historical techniques, nothing. They are just talking out of their ass, basically. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just, uh, with, the, with the katana, in many cases it's even worse. In many cases they haven't even handled a proper replica of a katana. So they have handled some of those cheap wall hangers that don't even have a full tang that weigh like <laughs> one half or two thirds of what an actual thing would weigh. And then they think, oh, this is so light and quick and everything. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, and you talk to, the guys I've talked to that's really been in the swords real heavy, they tell me the same thing. They says, actually, a katana is really a hard wielding sword to wield because it's the one edge, and uh, it takes a lot of practice. Where I take, I look at a uh, long sword, broad sword, or whatever. I think it's more like a, how you know, and I don't want to offend you or anything like that, but I think it's more like a a street fighter, you know, and uh, but there's. That one book, and you can tell me who it is. It's a German book, and it was done way, way back. I think it was seven, no, probably 1600s, mm -hmm. on how to fight with a longsword. And the shit that they did with that sword, they used every bit of it. Where on mm -hmm. the katana, they don't. You know, there's certain things they do with katana that uh, agree with me or disagree with me. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, Kara, could you maybe get that uh, longsword? Only if you stop screaming at me. Okay, will do. Well, the thing is, <laughs> yeah, I have a tendency to talk loud. <laughs> I know. This sometimes I, I just I don't even notice that. I have to get louder and louder, and, and then Kara's like, oh, stop it. <laughs> well, when you're but doing anyway. this, you have to. So you guys, when you guys meet me, some guys go, Oh my God! You can hear John from a mile away because I've been doing it so damn long. Jeez. So, anyway, yeah. so tell me your thought. Yeah, yeah. Get get back to it. That that's ex also exactly the main point that I had in that video that people don't didn't really seem to get. You know the um. But my intention with that video was not saying the katana is a bad sword, but no, then no, a lot no, of people know, yeah. jumped at it and, and said, oh, you, you're just dishing on it. No, I'm not. I'm just explaining why I don't think it's the best sword ever made. Okay, and, well, I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you had to fight with one sword, one or the other one, what would you do? What would, Which one would you use? Well, my, pers my personal choice would be a long sword simply because I like the versatility of it. Exactly. You know, just just because it has, you know, the the longer cross guard, and you know, some people have um, actually argued that oh, you know, the the tuba has the advantage because it, it covers the sides as well because it, there's the uh, uh, the disc guard, you know. But guess what? There are long swords that have additional rings at the side, so you get the exact same effect. Exactly. Plus, you're still getting the cross guard. And the cross guard is a big deal to me. Not only do you have that much more to parry with, you can also hook with it. You can you can strike with it. Like uh -huh. if you're a, if if the blades are bound, uh, you know, if if you're in the bind, close quarter, you can still whack him in the face with 
the pommel, uh, with the cross guard, and with the pommel as well. Mm -hmm. That's also the pommel is a pretty good weapon in and of itself. You know, if, if you ram that oh, yeah. in someone's face or if you strike with it, there's just a lot of versatility. There, there are so many things you can do with this, and also having two edges is of course also a good thing. So that's what I would personally go with. Well, well, see, and I tell people just like you know, on my knives, you know, um, you see these, you can catch a blade in there. Mm -hmm. And people are down there saying, oh, yeah, right, you're going to catch a blade in there. It's easier to do than what you think it is. But you use every part of this knife. Mm -hmm. That's what's great about it. Same thing with the long sword, you know, the pommel, the guards, all the other stuff. And G K James Keating put it the best way. Don't judge the world by your own shitty thoughts. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Very true. Well, yeah, but... Dude, when I, I watched that video of yours, I just thought, wow. But I like the katana. Don't get me wrong, you guys. I mm. think it's cool. I've made katanas. I've made uh, long swords. You name it, I've made it. And uh, really, my favorite sword I have right now, I should have brought it down, but I'm going to change the handle. It actually comes from Czechoslovakia, mm. and it's a beautiful blade, uh, hand-forged. And I like the guards on it. The guards, you know, I can trap a blade, all this other stuff. But uh, I like a longer handle. I like to be able to get two hands on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But God, that's just cool. So, tell me some other things. What What else are you into? What you're in? Well, how how I should say it is, what are you really into besides the the long sword? Oh, you mean swords or weapons swords, in general? Any weapon, any weapon. No, oh, any. Oh, pff. well, you know, my problem is I like way too much stuff. If I could, I would own one of every weapon that humans have ever come up with. <laughs> but of course, that would require several warehouses full and uh, like money, like Bill Gates, and <laughs> it's just not going to happen. <laughs> but, but if I could, I would at least get one of pretty much every major melee weapon that people have ever come up with because there's just so much interesting stuff and you know every sword and every weapon in general they all have their pros and cons they yeah. are you know for for the specific situation and historical context where they came up with they are awesome they are mm. you know they are meant to do certain things and they do that well so I'm just too much into all kinds of stuff so uh, you know swords axes, I like pole arms, I like all kinds of different stuff. One-handed swords, two-handed sabers, double-edged, you name it. <laughs> so, if you were going into battle, what would you take, a spear or a sword? Well, if I had to go to battle, I would probably go with a sword and shield. Simply okay. because, you know, on a battlefield, you never know, there might be archers, and if you don't have a shield and they're archers, you're dead. It's simple as that. So it, it would definitely have to be a shield. And, yeah, I would probably go with a sword again for reasons of versatility. You can do sword and axe and stuff like that, but it's just with a sword you have a bit more options. You know, it's funny. The guys that I know that in SCA, that some of the, the top fighters that I've met, they tell me, they said, John, a spear, you know, you can keep them back and mm -hmm. all that. But I think really what it comes down to is what you feel comfortable with. It's just like I tell everybody, you know, the guns you carry, you know. Some guys like 1911s. Some guys like Glocks, you know. And it's mm -hmm. what you feel comfortable with. I'm most comfortable with a 1911, you know. Mm. But, oh, yeah, um, me too. Yeah, it's it just, you know, but, yeah. Um, you know, and I tell people, I says, you know, we're, we're trying to develop a thing, and it's in... I'll tell everybody right now, you guys get a kick out of it. You can see I did a little thing with the buckler. We're trying to come up with a buckler that is bulletproof, that is light enough that you can actually carry it with you as kind of like, even kind of like a fashion type thing. But what we did is I was taking these guys with Airsoft, and I said, look, you guys, I want you, we're going to have a gunfight. Okay, we're going to have, both of us have airsoft, and we're going to go for it on each other, okay? And so they see this little thing on my side, and I go, one, two, three, go. And I'd stick that thing out, 
And if you guys look, think about it. A buckler, when it's sticking out there, it's so funny how guys would tune right into that buckler mm. that had an airsoft going bam, 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 bam. And they go, well, that's not fair. But if they were real bullets, it would go through. But it was making me think that saying, hey, look, it covers up my vitals because it's sticking out there so mm. far. And it's just like my fist. You know, it was... We, we, I came up with that, and I thought, God, man, if I can make that damn thing, that would be such a great uh, protection thing going up against guys, and you can just take the pistol over to the side, boom, boom, boom. And uh, so everything old is actually new. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, That's actually a very good idea. I like that. I mean, the, the shield is, is still in use. You still have riot shields and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And with, with the modern materials, the, the, the really awesome thing about the, the materials that we have available now is that you can get around some of the drawbacks, you know, like heavy. A lot of shields were very heavy weight. You can reduce that. And also a, a shield, especially a buckler to a minor degree, but especially a shield just obstructs your own vision if you put it mm. up. But you can have modern materials that are see-through, actually, yeah. and then, then you can just look right through there while still getting the protection. So yeah. there are a lot of possibilities, really. And yeah. that's that's a good good thinking to, to use one of those... Uh, you know things that that are tried and true, and they they would still work. I definitely agree. Yeah, it's just I mean, God, you think out. I tell everybody think outside the box. That's like mm -hmm. on the the long sword. I mean, you got two it. You have two edges, where a katana has one edge. You have the long guard that will protect your hands more, and you have the pommel heavier. It's made more for striking. You know, I always tell people, have the advantage. When you go into something like that, you want everything to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's that's why, you know, and I'm not trying to brag, guys, but that's why I've never lost a fight or any conflict I've been into because I always stack everything on my in my favor. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so. you, you want options, right? That's also generally the thing that I lean forward to. Like, for instance, if somebody asks, uh, you know, for self-defense, uh, what would you take, a knife or an, an impact device? And I just say, take both. Like, yeah, exactly. Whip, whip out something like, you know, something like this, a blackjack. Whip that thing out first, so yeah. you have a, a less lethal option. You mm -hmm. know, whack, whack him on the arm, on the head, in the face, if necessary. If that doesn't work, or if you get disarmed, or whatever, or if it gets really nasty, reach for the knife if you have to. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and have an, another backup if something happens to that knife. Just you know, carry three things just in case. So, where are you originally from? Well, I was born in Germany, and I lived in Norway for a while, and now in Canada. And I definitely plan to stay here. Ah, oh, God, Norway. The, God, they're having some real problems with Muslims <laughs> in Norway right here. Yeah, so. yeah Norway is, you know, originally... Um, the, the plan was to stay there, but then it was after a while, after living there for a while, it was kind of, nah. <laughs> It's not really not really our thing, especially... Uh, I mean, the, the main reason, I think, was that it, you just have very limited opportunities. You know, if you're looking into something, like if you're interested in, in knives and weapons and, and stuff, or if you're thinking about starting a business that is not quite mainstream, it's just the market isn't there, you don't have the opportunities, uh, lack of options, you know, small cities and this and that, and just... North America is, of course, the thing in that regard. It's all about diversity and opportunities and everything. Mm. Why don't you move to Utah? <laughs> yeah, we've actually th also thought about the U.S., but then again, you know, what, what we've seen about the political climate was kind of, uh, no thanks, I think we'll, we'll be in fine Utah, up here. we can have anything we want. I can carry a samurai sword or a broadsword on my back down the street just so it's in the open. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was definitely, you know, weapon laws was definitely one of the tempting things. But then again, you know, stuff like indefinite detention of citizens and nah, I don't want to get, get anywhere near that. 
<laughs> yeah, things are getting weird here in the United States, but they're just, mm. you know, and that's where us people, you know, you and I, we know what weapons can do, mm. and we know how important it is to be armed. Yeah. And even, uh, well, you're in Canada, uh, it's harder for you guys to carry a gun. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I believe... Well, and it's been proven time and time again, armed society is a polite society. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That, that's one of those things that people have come up with again and again. When I, I've already made several videos on you know, certain weapon laws, why they are stupid and pointless and, and why they, they don't have a positive effect. And quite often, the, the argument that people come up with is this, oh, but if... if if you carry weapons around, then you're more likely to end the conflict violently. But no, it's I, as far as I see it, it's the exact opposite. Because you know, if you're in a bar and and you know that the guy doesn't have uh, weapons or anything, and, and you think, yeah, I'm I'm tougher, stronger, whatever, I can just beat him up, then mm -hmm. you're much more likely to start shit because you think you can get away with it. But yeah. if you see that guy has a 911 at his side, and it's like, yeah, okay, let's just just stop this nonsense and you know it's just too much risk you know yeah. that the typical criminal looks out for some for somebody who's vulnerable you know the, exactly. the typical victim you know walking around not not noticing anything glued to the phone or, or you know kind of anxious or whatever and it looks vulnerable and then yeah bam that's what, what they go for but if you're armed if you have, <laughs> if people walked around with a sword openly carrying, I'm pretty sure they would think twice before attacking someone like well, that. I was the highest paid doorman in here, Utah for a long time, for about six years. And in our bar, I had a 45 underneath the counter. And mm. we check IDs and all the other stuff. Carried a big ass Almar. And uh, on my side, I had a baton, uh, had a stun gun. I had everything. And the whole time I was working there, I only had something like four uh, problems in the bar. That was it. And uh, it's you know, and everybody knew all the guys in Spankies were armed. <laughs> That's the way it was, you know. But you know, we had less fights in that bar than any bar. The bar right down the street that was just as popular every Friday, Saturday night. Cops were down there. They were, you know, in our bar, nothing. And we had, you know, Cameron Diaz come into our bar. We had all these real famous people. It was pretty funny, but it is. I mean, when they see you and you're dressed kind of wild and they're looking at you thinking, shit, I don't want to get into it with this guy. You know, <laughs> it, you know changes real fast. So mm -hmm. you're right, dude. It, you know, people get real polite. When uh, they know you can you can hurt them real quick, mm -hmm. and that. But geez, but God, this is such an honor to talk to you, buddy. God, I'm yes, thank you. I was definitely honored by your invite. It was like, oh, cool. <laughs> it was well, definitely I, unexpected. I've seen that video. I've turned it on to so many people, saying you got to watch this, you know. And uh, it was just like everything I've taught, told people, and every time I've I've said something like this, it just, oh my God. It's <laughs> the flood of comments come in, and, and guys get violent about it. I don't know if oh, you yeah. had any like that, but it's like, whoa. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You know, but my favorite is always those people who get all pissy about a video, and then all they do is say, no, you're wrong, and then they, they make some random claim, you know, completely empty assertion, no arguments, yeah. nothing, just no, blah, blah, blah. And then they yeah. expect to be taken seriously. I'm like... Really, you can't even argue for your point. You just state it and then, then leave it there. Ah, oh, come on, get out of here. <laughs> now tell me something in a sword fight, you know, because mine's more knife that I'm geared towards. But the guys I've played with sword, the and the SCA guys and all that, I found out if I keep my sword to their sword like glue, mm. I come out on top usually. Mm-hmm. Because if I if I'm following their sword and I'm in their sword, I can flip it up into them. I can mm -hmm. push into them. I can usually use my strength. Or if I feel them flowing a different stuff, I can counteract it. 
and come in. Is is that what you think too, or are you, or yep. are you a, a opponent of keeping away and just you know? Well, it, there, there are a lot of different strategies that you can make work, but that is a very good approach, you know, sticking to it. In fact, uh, what you said about, you know, feeling the blade, that's actually a uh, one of the main concepts in historical sword fighting, where mm -hmm. uh, it, it is even called feeling, where you, you know, the moment you make blade contact, you, you feel what the intention of your opponent is, and, and you can uh, react accordingly. Like, if, if the, the, the blades make contact, and let's say that the guy pushes you know, in, in this direction, mm -hmm. the moment I disengage and release, since he still ha has the pressure, the force will will, for, uh, will make him yep. go off balance, and then I can just sidestep and boom, right in yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's a very important thing. And also wrestling is, is very vital in sword fighting. Like, you, you quite often end up in a situation where the blades have contact. I mean, that's basically where both kind of want to end up because that's a, the safest position for, for either of them. Mm -hmm. Because then, then you, you kind of know where you're at and you can respond better. And then quite often it's, you know, you, you go in there, make contact with the blade, and then you, you just, you know, grab the arm and, and push yeah. him to the side, or push him off balance, wind around, you know, force the blade around in some way. And, yeah, that, that's very effective. Yeah, see, I wrestled for years. I started wrestling when I was six and that's one of the things you know I'm feeling the guy how he's moving and uh, I can just counteract him or even a real stronger guy real quick and I and that's where you know I picked up with the sword and I haven't had you know just the stuff that I've watched and it that that old German book what is that book and it you showed some of the the things uh, I think it was before the video it showed some of those uh, stances and mm -hmm. strikes. There were, there, what was that book? And it was from Germany. It was oh, yeah. There, there are actually a, a number of different books. There are several different uh, historical fencing manuals from uh, medieval and Renaissance times. And uh, there are, you know, the, the most famous names are Talhofer, uh, Ringeck, uh, let's see who else, uh, Meyer. Uh, and a bunch of others. You know, th there's a number of different treatises. So I I don't know which one exactly. Where can we seen. get these books? Do you know where we can get? Yes. Get these books? Yes. Uh, let me just uh, open the website right here. I can I can do the screen share thing and then show you where you can find those. Because that just need. You know, and, yeah, the, and the knife fighting stuff, I'll, I'll be talking while you, you're doing this. The knife fighting stuff is basically <clears throat> Jim Bowie and those guys that really got into the Bowie knife. It was more or less fencing moves, but they're a little bit street brawling moves too, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you use. And uh, on a knife, I'm not looking to get in with your knife. I'm taking anything that's in my area that's what I'm going to strike, you know, so I'm going to take you a little bit at a time. I'm look, not looking to do the coup de grace to you. Okay, mm -hmm. that's right there. Cool. Wow. Yep. That, that's basically on, on this website. They have all kinds of, of different uh, manuscripts here. Uh, this, this, this one here, that, that's just a German section, and you can see already this section is really long. Wow. Wow. You know? Yeah, this one book that they were talking about, and I seen it a long time ago, it said it was the pinnacle of German uh, sword fighting. And uh, this guy was, I, I, I wish I knew who he was, but they said this guy was just a killer. They said mm. he just really knew his stuff. You know, so, yeah. But, mm. yeah, this is cool. So do you do very much with knives at all, or do you, or? Uh, it's primarily swords, but I also do knives to, to some extent. And um, but I actually may uh, recorded something recently where I want to make a video about, uh, you know, the difference in uh, sword versus knife defense. You know, mm -hmm. if if for some reason you're in the very very unfortunate situation that you have to defend unarmed against a sword versus a knife, uh, it, it's kind of interesting to um, to compare the two. 
Mm. Because in some ways, it's actually it can be a bit easier to defend against the sword, be mm -hmm. simply because uh, you know that there's longer leverage and, yeah, and you, yeah. you see the attack coming a bit more than with a sword uh, with, than with a knife, because with, with a knife it's just this quick flick and and just yeah. multiple stabs and everything that's very difficult to defend against. Whereas with a sword, if if the guy just does one attack, then you can step in and, and intercept the arms and try to mm. trap the arms. Mm -hmm. And stuff. It's still not easy, of course. It's never easy to go no, unarmed. No, you got that much long of a, a blade that I have to get through. See, if if we were going at it, me and you, my whole thing would be getting to get into you fast. Mm -hmm. to where I'm making up that distance so you're not down there nailing me with, yeah. uh, you know, um, my wife. Let me tell her, honey, I'll call you right back. Okay, <laughs> I'm on line with a guy. Okay. Oh, so anyway, um, yeah, I'd be trying to get into you, but trying to get past that length of that blade, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude. <laughs> and, and, and also, also the the thing is, if you're dealing with somebody who who's experienced with swords and they know what yeah. they are doing, you're kind of screwed anyway. Because the yeah. problem is, they they might first try to to use the entire length of the blade to. Yeah. You know, personally, I would probably go for for thrusts mainly because yeah. they are quicker, they are more difficult to defend to defend against. But if the guy manages to get past the blade, well, I can still do use half sorting. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen that one demonstration oh, oh, uh, yeah. with the, that you can actually grab the blade without cutting yourself, and that's where where you're really screwed. If if the guy uses half sorting, you know, I can get all the way back here with the point. It's, it's basically the point is right next to my face. Basically, I can get that far in with half sorting just by moving this my my right arm back so much, and then I can can just you know do very quick stabs, and then I I almost turn this into a knife basically because exactly. I, I didn't have to have the very short blade. So if you run into that, you're kind of done for. Well, I tell people, I, you know, guys that come in and get their swords done, I go, so tell me what kind of edge do you want your sword to have? And I says, I can make it shaving sharp. And they go, well, well, yeah, that's what I want. I go, well, traditionally they weren't shaving sharp hmm. because they would hold up high. I go, it dep depends on how the angle is on the blade. It will cut through you in a heartbeat, and it doesn't feel that sharp. You know, hmm. and uh, I was explaining to people about that, and, and it's just like they can't grasp it. You know, hmm. that's why um, I actually did a sword. It was oh, probably about twenty twenty one or so, but the the blade was only sharpened that far, and then down here, it mm -hmm. was a uh, big open spot, kind of like Conan's sword, to where hmm. I could grab, take it to make it shorter. And whip it, you know, and different stuff like that. But but uh, that's it. But how? Okay, so you're really in the swords. How sharp should they really be? Well, they have to be pretty sharp, like not shaving sharp, because the problem is if if it's that sharp, the edge just won't hold up. Like the yeah. first contact with with another blade or with anything, and, and just yeah. it it rolls over or it breaks or chips or whatever. That that's not what you want to happen. Mm -hmm. But it still has to be sharp enough to to get a a draw or push cut yeah. to to mm -hmm. bite into material because mm -hmm. there there are some techniques where you where, where you really end up up close and I have for instance I've seen one where you basically end up uh, under the hand of of your opponent and and you just slice into the the uh, the oh, wrist. Okay. I know what you're okay. Yeah, there, yeah. There was, Actually, actually, there was one which uh, kind of draws the edge across, you know, kind of skins the, the uh -huh, hand, uh -huh. you know, like that, very nasty. So in order to do that, it, of course, has to be fairly sharp. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I would generally say if it's, if it's paper cutting sharp, you're pretty good. If it's uh -huh. not quite paper cutting sharp, it, it might still be good enough, but uh, it, it shouldn't be overly... Sure, but also this this common misconception that medieval long swords were just blunt, just to go against armor. That's nonsense. No, that is yeah, just to that, go that. against armor. Like if you if you actually look at the the historical uh, fencing manuals, the way they deal with armor, 
they don't even do the cuts to the armor because they know you can't penetrate plate yeah. with that. It's, it's, yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. You, you just can't do it. So what they do is they, do, they use half-sorting and then they try to get in between the gaps of yeah. the armor with the point and they thrust okay. the, the, the point into the gap. So it's, it's, if you want a blunt impact device, you take a mace or a flail or whatever. You don't mm -hmm. take a sword and make it blunt. It's just... Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I was showing guys. I says this one guy was saying, yeah. I said they go up underneath the the armor and try to find a thing and they'll hold up high. Well, aren't you going to cut your hand off? And I go, well, it's sharp. You can feel it. But most of the guys wore gloves, so it's not going to cut in. Mm -hmm. But still, I mean, if you have a good hold on it, it's not going to cut you unless you. Move yeah. Exactly. If you make sure it doesn't slide in your hand, yeah. it can't really cut you. And yeah. also, there are. You can grip it in a way where you don't even have contact. Like if I mm -hmm. if I grip it yeah. like this, yeah. you know, with the yeah. thumb up here and like that, I, I still have a fairly good grip on it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't even contact my, my skin. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm far enough away from from the edge mm -hmm. that it can't even cut me. So Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, it's funny how guys they just think, you know, you get people come into my shop and and if I put a knife, like I'll, I do a thing where I'm showing how sharp the back cut is and I'm pushing really hard, and I say, now watch this, you know, I'll push here and I'll show them how it starts cutting because of that abrupt edge. Mm. And the guys are just freaking, you know. <laughs> if I move it, it will cut me. Mm. But, you know, if I grab a hold of it, you know, and just, you know, but it's it's funny. But, God, all this stuff, dude, I love what you're doing. I, I just adore it, you know. Marry me. <laughs> 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 well, vice versa. I also love the, the stuff that you do because you know bladesmithing is really fascinating. It's awesome stuff, and I really like your designs. You know, if I could afford one of your knives, I would have already gotten one. <laughs> well, dude, we can work something out. I like it that much. In fact, what we ought to do, you know, I did a tactical sword. We ought to do a little tactical mm -hmm. sword, a modern tactical sword type thing and we'll put our minds together maybe we'll call each other up and do a secret <laughs> <laughs> conspiracy that could be really cool so. you know that actually fits very well because I, I am actually purely looking for bladesmiths to make uh, some of my designs I'm already in contact with a Canadian knife maker who okay. uh, is going to make a, a design that I have. And I'm also, um, there's a sword that I want to have made that I'm kind of, let's see, I have some scribblings here. Something like, no, wait, uh, there, something like this. Oh, you know, cool. Where, where, where the idea is, I, I kind of want something that combines as many useful features as possible. You know, mm -hmm. I want to, Go with something that you know curved blade just to get that uh, to facilitate those, that cutting power. Let me yeah. see if I there. But also, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, the the backside, the false edge, that's sharpened, yeah. so that uh -huh. you can still get those you know kind of like with a double-edged sword, you can still get those cuts in, and those secondary quillions from a great sword, uh -huh. so that you can. You can actually hold on to it and, and still have a secondary guard, and you can also attack with those as kind of spikes uh -huh. and knuckle guard for extra protection. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know stuff like well, that. Well, we could do something like that, dude. Yeah, I'd be more than happy. We could we could work something out. I like the design. It's mm. a cool design. You know, I can see the advantages of it. Mm -hmm. But God, Skull Guy, it was great talking to you, buddy. And. Yeah, same uh, here. You know, we've got to do this more often. Definitely. Like, you should come to Utah and drink Guinness with me <laughs> out of a big Viking. Oh, yeah, that, that thing is awesome, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, buddy, call me anytime. You know, uh, I want to talk to you some more on doing some designs and different stuff like that. That mm -hmm. could be really cool. I could sure. really do it. You've seen the sword that I did for uh, the Wheel of Time, didn't you? Uh, I don't think I, I saw that actually. Yeah, um, it's the wheel of time. They call it something else. Um, but anyway, if you guys do a, I'll find out the name. I'll put it on my Facebook or whatever. But uh, it was the crane sword. It's 
like the Lord of the Rings or something like that. And the way I did it, you can actually, it's a, between a saber and a, kind of a katana sort of, but you can hold up high on it and all that. And it, it's cool, but anyway. But yeah, buddy, so God, let's keep in touch. And yeah, I sure. hope everybody enjoyed this. This guy's the man. All my guys that subscribe to me, pull your head out of your ass. Subscribe to this guy. He knows what he's talking about. You know, I grovel at your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe or else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, buddy. It was good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Thanks. I'll talk to you later. Yep. Um, you want to answer a couple of yeah, questions? Yeah, we can ask, the, uh, answer some questions, yeah. Scala, if you want to hang out, we're going to just answer some of these questions in chat uh, before we sign off. Uh, so feel free to hang out with us. Yeah, like. feel free. No, oh, sure, why not? <laughs> okay. Um, and you want, anybody ask Skull some questions, too? I you got to forgive me, Skull. I don't know how this kind of works. You know, this is kind of a new thing that Steve got me involved, which I actually really like it. So I don't know, you know, so if anybody has any questions or whatever, go ahead. Uh, one of the first questions, actually, is somebody asking you about that Wheel of Time sword and uh, asking if it was ever done or did we get that completed? Oh, no, it's completed. They did a, a movie on it. Well, it's a short movie to showing how it's going to be. If you go on, God, I can't. Remember what the hell, if somebody's on and can tell me what they call it different, but it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings, uh, but the crane sword, but it was called the Wheel of Time, but they call it something else, so I can't remember. But, yeah, it was done, and it was it's really cool. So... No, that's yeah. no. It's it, it kind of looks it kind of looks like that a little bit, but not. But it's from the Robert Jordan series of books. The yeah. Wheel of Time. Yeah, it kind of looks like that, but a little bit different. Okay. Then well, that. Show yeah, yeah. So. Um, then. Uh, some people uh, obviously still want to. Uh, Say how much they love the katana. Uh, how y'all says, I know it's not perfect. I just love it. Which I think you pointed out in your video, Scala, that you know if you if that's your preference, that's nice too. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. I, I'm not gonna go and, and tell anybody, no, your personal taste is wrong. That would be yeah. stupid. <laughs> it's like if, if that's your favorite sword, hey, more power to you. Fine. Perfect. And and <laughs> it's it's what yeah, like what I said too. It's what you feel comfortable with. Now, hey, Scala, there was another thing. Um, they didn't go, for the guys I've really talked to that really know on uh, katanas, they didn't really go blade to blade. They used the back of the blade. Well, they tried to use the back of the blade if they had the block. It was more or less they would they would sit there and posture, try to get, you know, that one cut to kill. Mm. Am, am I not right? With, uh, by the way, that's a thing in and of itself, you know, that this one cut thing. I personally uh, kind of have a problem with that because if, if your style builds on getting in this one huge cut which is typically mm. from what I've seen is also a cut where they kind of leave themselves open a lot because yeah. they, they, you know, they, they do this wild swing and, and then they afterwards they, they stand there for a moment exposed because they, mm -hmm. they, they are betting on that. You know, they're betting 100% yeah. on this one strike kill and I don't necessarily see that happen. I mean, there is no guarantee that even if you yeah. can make it past the defense, even if you can give them a good hit with a sword, there is just no chance they're going to drop dead. Even if you, even if you manage to give them a lethal wound, they might still just go on for a while, just because you know, fueled by adrenaline, and just because that's how the body works. It just doesn't just drop dead as if struck by Zeus Thunderbolt. That's yeah. just not how it happens. So, but, that's, uh, but that's how they really fought, though, the Japanese, wasn't it? 
or yeah, it was and, all bullshit. And, and it's and my, movie shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, and my suspicion is that you know it works in that context because if both uh, train that way and, and if both have that yeah. mindset of you know I, I just have to get past that one strike and then land my own one gigantic strike if both act that way and if both you know kind of neglect their defense right after the cut yeah I can see it work because that's exactly the problem with that you know you do this one big strike and then you you don't uh, you don't end it in a guard so much, but you just oh, right there, you're open, and then you can be counterattacked, and then they can really bury that bl blade in your body. And if you have even the cultural expectation, if I get hit with a sword once, that's it, you might even react to it. Uh, you've probably heard about that in terms of firearms, you know. Yeah. The way somebody reacts if they are being shot, if, if they think, you know, from having watched movies, they think that you get knocked back or you, you yeah. collapse or whatever. If they notice they are being shot, they might actually do so just because of the expectation psychologically. Whereas somebody who doesn't even notice they are being shot because they are full of adrenaline and whatever might just move normally and then afterwards they notice, oh shit, I have a hole in myself. Yeah, exactly. You know, that kind of deal. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's cool. God, that's kind of what I, way I thought it was. And the thing is, too, it didn't make sense because, you know, I've played with some real Japanese armor. That shit's tough. They're not going to mm -hmm. go through that fucking thing in one swipe. I, I didn't understand. I, I That's why I always thought... Okay, so you're trying to posture for one damn uh, big coup de gras, and that armor, God, that's tough. That's mm -hmm. tough shit that they had, you know? So, I don't know. Maybe it's something we don't know. It uh, may also really just be, you know, the cultural thing and, and with the, the martial arts, because... Um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, Japanese martial arts uh, are more accessible in some way because they have the living tradition, whereas the European, there is very limited living tradition. It's mainly military saber and stuff, so for uh -huh. long sword, you don't really have that. But mm -hmm. I also actually see a practical advantage of that because if you just have the, the historical manuals from the time when they are used, you can be pretty sure that, you know, that's the real thing. Whereas with a martial art, it may have transformed over time and turned into a bit more of a sport or competition or, you know, art kind of thing, you know, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Because they might have refined some movements to to look better, to be more aesthetically pleasing, mm -hmm. but not quite as effective in, in a real fight anymore because it doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. That's just I, I don't yeah. know if that's really the case, but that's just a suspicion that I have that mm -hmm. this might explain some of that. I'm just gonna pop in. Uh, we've got a couple people saying that that Wheel of Time sword I think was called the Warder. Does that sound right? Uh, no, it's the the Wheel of Time sword was called the Crane sword. The Crane sword, okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then, uh, actually, I had a question for you guys. Okay. Talking on this long sword katana thing. And I always thought the katana was special, not so much because of its shape or thing, but, but because the Japanese steel at that time was so much better than the European steel. The actual forging of the knife, the blade, was better. Is that the case or is that not the case? You know what? It, there were some steals. Well, like when the and you could probably tell me the truth too. What you you think when the you know England went in to take care of the Muslims and all that other stuff, they were finding out the Muslim swords were better, and because Damascus, Damascus mm -hmm. steel actually came from Damascus. Everything I've there's there's well, how do I put this? I've heard other things about that, but it kind of, you know, Damascus steel, what is, Dam where's Damascus? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, they, they got better at making swords because they took, the British took the, uh, England took the uh, swords back, got into the secrets on how they were making their s steel, and everything, I think everything was pretty much on a, uh, uh, even playing, you know, level with uh, at a certain time. Do you agree with me or? 
Hmm. Uh, from from you know, I haven't studied this stuff, so take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But from what I know, the thing was the reason why they came up with the folding of the steel was basically that they have had low quality iron sands available. Yeah. So yeah, it, thing, the yeah. material in and of itself, the iron wasn't of such a high quality as you had in Europe simply because of mm -hmm. what they had available. So mm -hmm. they had to come up with that in order to strengthen it and make it more usable. So if if you have a European sword that does the same thing with higher quality material, the end result will be better. And there are actually some very good examples. There are some mm -hmm. uh, Viking Age swords really swords would have well. yeah, really. amazing quality. Yeah, like yeah. They, they have a, a quality to the extent that it couldn't be done until the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there was very high quality stuff out there. And yeah. the thing is, some people seem to think that folded steel, just because it, it's folded, that in and of itself makes it better. But mm -hmm. there are plenty of examples. You know, recently I got this, this one knife uh, on eBay pretty cheaply, mainly because I like the shape. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this thing right here, you know, that is folded. But, yeah. uh -huh. That's, uh, but, the, the, but the thing is, con considering the price and the limited in information, I'm pretty sure they just took fairly low quality steel and folded that into each other. So well some of the stuff some some of it uh, it depends on what you get. But what what's great about folded steel is when they're doing Damascus and everything, it has like my O1 that's more traditional. It has iron and high carbon. And it'll take more of a bang side to side and you can bend it back. Where if you do just a straight high carbon Depends on how it's tempered. Will usually break in two pieces. Basically, stainless steel. If you put in a vise and start bending it, certain stainless steels will break in three pieces. High carbon, and it's uh, oh pounded, will break in two pieces. Damascus will usually bend mm -hmm. and you can bend it back. But so that's that's the thing where um, it was the yin yang effect. And what they were getting with the Japanese sword was uh, it was if it took a strike to the side, it wouldn't snap it like in a heartbeat. But now the steels that we're using, like A2, God, it's so much better. You put an A2, just stock removal, up against a uh, old Japanese sword. Oh shit, man! The A2 is gonna kick ass over it. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's so. also something that a lot of people don't seem to know that you know, even the the best traditional made swords, it's they they couldn't achieve the quality that we, we no. can today simply because yeah. we have the the advanced technology. Like the best steels nowadays nowadays blow everything out of the water that has yeah. ever been. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What other ones do you have? Anything else, Steve? Not much coming in right now that I can find here. Um, Uh, there's some from earlier. There's a uh, some question asking Scalip how he likes the Canada. Um, and then I've got some guys asking if either of you like the uh, axe as a weapon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <certainly. laughs> yeah, you want to hack through a wall of flesh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's, I mean, axe is a deadly weapon, and, and Scala yeah, probably could tell you more on axes. I'm more into tomahawk type things, and mm. you know, but uh, Scala could probably answer that more. Yeah, you know, the the good thing about an axe is you don't need as much training for it as with a sword. You know, with a sword, you have to be pretty precise with the edge alignment and everything. The axe, you know, even if your edge alignment is off, you just whack it into the target. It's going to do some serious damage, yeah. and it also has some uh, particular advantages, like you can you can hook into the shield and pull it away, or mm -hmm. you can you can hook the limbs, and you can or, or the weapon or whatever you can draw it to the side, and uh, you can choke up on it and then, then use it really close quarters. So it definitely has some advantages, but um, it, of course it also has some cons. Like the balance is so far. Uh, towards the axe head because you have that hunk of metal there and yeah. then just the wooden haft. So 
you, you will probably have a harder time recovering from a swing. Like, yeah. if you swing at them and you miss, and it's, uh, it, it's going to take a lot more effort to stop it and then bring it back into a, a guard position. Mm -hmm. So generally, I would say that if you want to go with an axe, you kind of need a shield or a buckler. Yeah. Uh, with a, with a tomahawk, less so because, you know, tomahawks are usually a bit smaller and lighter and everything, and you can choke up. You have a bit more options there. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally, yeah, pros and cons, like everything. It just depends on what you train with and, and what you want to go for. Yeah. What else you got? Um, I've got Luke Moray asking a question about, uh, I guess, old-time combat, and he's was asking if the, the Japanese style was more based on one and one where the European, I guess, was maybe more of an army-on-army kind of style. I don't agree with that. God, they had big, gigantic wars Japan did. Mm -hmm. God, they did you just slamming against each other, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I, I, a gentleman thing. I, I think the Samurai Warrior was, it was kind of like, code of of a warrior, the way they fought. That's why I think the European guy would kick ass over a Japanese guy because he just he wants to get it done. Hmm. You know, it doesn't care care how he looks doing it and all the other stuff. Do you do you agree, Skull? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you also have to take into consideration like one of the functions of, of samurai was basically that they were sent against unarmed peasants to, to yeah. slaughter them and terrorize them, and, yeah. well, but that's not so honorable necessarily, so they probably also had their dirty tricks to some extent, yeah. but, um, you know, just based on the, the, the fundamentals of, of the different fighting styles, it seems that the Japanese style is a bit more on aesthetics and so yeah. on, whereas the European style is just, I do whatever I have to to take that sucker down. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and... Uh, Returning to the battlefield versus uh, dual thing, well, you had both in either. You know, you had yeah. plenty of, of battles, you know, open battlefield and everything in Japan, and you had plenty of duels in Europe as well. In fact, uh, the, the historical manuals that you have, they address mainly duels. You know, duels with longsword, with sword and buckler, and everything. Like, battlefield manuals, I don't... I'm not even sure if there are any, very few. I mean, okay, there are some manuals that actually cover fighting uh, armored on horse, which mm -hmm. would be more battlefield, but um, mm -hmm. most of them are actually uh, unarmored duels. So there was yeah. plenty of that, too. Mm -hmm. I had some guys come in. I, I told my guys before, your guys might be interested. I had a guy one day come into my shop, and he brought in a rapier. And he goes, I need this sharpened. He says, okay, bud. I says, you know, I just got here. I got to get in the mode to sharpen it. I says, come back in two days, you know. Usually if you bring in a knife, I get it done right there. But a sword's a little different because it's so long, and mm. especially a rapier, and I'm just down there going, I says, I got to get in the mode, okay. And he goes, no, uh, I need it done now. <laughs> it's not going to fucking happen. <laughs> you know? He says, you know, you've got to give me a little bit of time. He goes, you don't understand. I go, what, what, what don't I understand? And he goes, I have a duel in a half an hour. So what? Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I started thinking, you know, if I sharpen this guy's, you know, rapier, and he kills the guy, and they kiss. I went down to Razor's Edge to get my rapier sharpened before I took this guy out. I thought, oh. shit, man, this could be, you know, on today's show and all this other shit. But then on the other end, wait a sec, could I be an accessory? <laughs> <laughs> Murder. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't do it. I just, I decided uh -huh. to do it. It was pretty funny, you know. Uh, I, I wonder if the ghost just, Kidding or, or oh, he said he or told me where he was going. He said he had to be there. He was very adamant about it, and he was just and he and I said, well, what did he do to you? And he says he said something about my woman, and uh, I'm down there going, okay, well, oh, all right. <laughs> and he was just, dude, he was pissed. I also had the king of the elves come into my shop one day and wanted me to do a sword from him, for him, but he just didn't have enough 
elvish magic to pay for it. And he should have made a drawing. It was like three grand. <laughs> and I told him, okay. well, you have pointed ears. And he goes, not all of us have pointed ears. And they're going, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That that is some yeah. In some cases, I guess it's just a, an instant of well, I kind of forgot to take my medication, but I really have to get to that duel. That's pretty funny. Keep things live. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine that. It must be interesting with some people that come in. <laughs> we got a guy here that we're making a. Uh, let me wait a sec. Go ahead, buddy. Hey, John. What's up? This is me. How are you doing? Well, I'm on the line with Skull. He's on. Oh, he's on? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're doing, are you watching? Uh, yeah, I think there's a slight lag in audio as well as video, but uh, oh. I'm watching. <laughs> well, do you got, a, you got a question for one of us? Um, actually, I do. Um, what's the difference between Saber, as in dueling, you know, the traditional painting versus the buzzword? Oh, a, a saber versus a uh, oh. broadsword? You can answer that, uh, mm. Skull. Did you hear that? Yep, yeah, I, I heard okay. that. Here, I'm going to let well, you go, buddy, and listen on air. Okay, yeah. Bye -bye. Go ahead. Well, I, I haven't studied it much yet, but uh, from what I've seen so far, saber and broadsword are fairly similar. I mean, first of all, both being one-handed weapons are, of course, certain fundamentals are the same. And uh, generally, they seem to go for, you know, kind of mo more of an arc in the motion. You know, with a long sword, you sometimes have the, 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 the direct, you know, snap cuts and stuff like that, whereas uh, with, with those weapons, they have a tendency to just swing them around a bit more and, and, and go more in, in circles and stuff. So it's it's kind of similar in some ways, but uh, generally if you have a, a curved saber and you want to go for those draw cuts, you um, it's kind of this compromise between reach and cutting power. You know, if you want to go... Let me just grab this thing right here. That would be a good example of uh, a, you know, sort yeah. that you would use in a draw cut. So with a draw cut, you kind of have to keep your uh, your wrist straight in line with the forearm okay. so you kind of do, do more of an arc whereas with a uh, with a broadsword with a straight blade you can kind of go more into this extended cut yeah although I shouldn't really say that necessarily because there are actually saber techniques for you know modern uh, military saber where they do actually they, they actually use what is called a saber grip, so it's kind of uh, so kind of like this, not a hammer grip, but more yeah, kind yeah, of th yeah, this yeah. kind of deal. And and then they they also do a snap cut. So yeah, I guess there are definitely some similarities. You know, I'll Generally, tell you, I'm not comfortable with saber. I, I it feels you know you're doing a lot of movements like that, different stuff. I I just don't feel you know I'd rather have a uh, long sword. And that I'd, I'd even rather I think I'd even rather have a katana over a you know a saber. Tell you the truth, mm. the way they you know. But I do like that arc where there's a move you can do where you're touching the blade and you're just just a little bit of a movement and it just turns it right up into them. Mm. That's really cool. You can go right into their neck. You know, but yeah. And also the thing with the with the curved blade, of course, is you you do have some. Uh, potential to go around the defenses because yeah. you kind of because of the curvature you can kind of go you know that's and, what and I'm saying defense. there's a move with the the saber where you go in and you just 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 move it and you're right there in the guy's neck you're just mm -hmm. boom, that fast yeah. yeah yeah so what else anything else I think we're uh, about the end of it here okay buddy well cool well it was awful good talking to you dude and this is my second time doing this, you're at ease with this. Yeah. Uh, you know, by our next time when we're on, I'd be more at ease. But we'll come up with some really cool stuff. What maybe we'll do is do some drawings, kind of show each other and say, hey, look, you know, let's see if we can get something going and between me and you and mm -hmm. make a million dollars off our viewers. <laughs> <laughs> 
Get him in the sword. God, can you imagine? Sword fighting in the streets. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah, that could be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Does you, are you married? Yep. Does Sitting your, right over there. <laughs> <laughs> Does your wife share your uh, enthusiasm for swords? Yeah, fortunately, yes. I don't have to deal with uh, the problems that some people have where uh, the wife is uh, all the time like, uh, well, there was horrible weapons, and I was like, no. Like, I want this. <laughs> I want this pole arm, or I want that sword, or whatever. Okay. <laughs> so does she do one of these things where she comes in in a sleek little negligee with a big-ass sword and say, get naked? <laughs> <laughs> That hasn't happened so far, but <laughs> no, no sorts of sexual context. <laughs> We're not into that necessarily, but <laughs> my wife, my wife loves guns, loves knives, all that other stuff. Awesome. So I got a good woman. She's really good mm -hmm. in all that. So, so anyway, but yeah, God. Here's another thing, God. One of these days, if we, me, and you could meet up, that'd be fun too. We could do a thing. Yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. Be great. So going to the shot show. Yeah, going to the shot show. That's a big thing. Yeah, you guys will see me there with malicious. So anyway, but once again, awful good talking to you, buddy. Let's do this again. Yep, you too. <laughs> and I'm signing off, everybody. I got to drink some more Guinness out of my big fucking Viking horn. <laughs> <laughs> So, good talking to you, buddy. Yep, thanks for having me. Okay, we'll see you guys. Yep.